you are in the ultimate virtual fundraising course. Today's class is class number one, which is really all about planning your virtual fundraising events. So before diving in any further, my name is Candace. I'm the manager of success and education here at Causevox. So I've been working with nonprofits like yours over the last five years to help them grow their digital fundraising um, on Causevox. So a little bit about who we are. So Causevox is a digital fundraising platform that helps you raise more with less effort. While a lot of software is very clunky, it's complex and contract bound, Causevox actually tidies up your digital fundraising. So you can run donation pages, crowdfunding, peer to peer, and virtual fundraising in less time with less hassle. So <clears throat> let's lay, get a lay of the land for our course today. So today's class is all about planning your virtual fundraising events. I'll get into the agenda in just a minute. For our next class, that's gonna be on Friday at 2 p.m., so the 26th, so mark your calendars. You'll be getting an invite for that session after today's class, so I'll be getting that out to everyone, so you should get that um, later this afternoon. Um, and yeah, we'll dive into everything on executing your virtual fundraiser. So there may be some things that we don't get to today that we'll get to in more detail next week. Um, and then our class number three is actually individually scheduled. So we'll get our time to sit down one-on-one -on -one to go over your virtual fundraising plans so that we can have a coaching session to help you optimize them and really go over any individual questions that we don't get to during the Q&As. So uh, in, in addition to just the live classes, you're going to get access to all of the slides and all the recordings of our classes so that you can have those later um, on hand. You can share them with your team if you'd like. Um, so you'll get access to everything as soon as our class ends. I'll probably get that full recording out to you tomorrow. We also do provide that one-on-one -on -one consultation. You also will be getting a virtual event planning guide and calendar template. We have a huge template that we're going to be actually talking through today that will help you plan your virtual fundraising event. So I'll be sharing that with you momentarily. And you also get Causevox to help you run your virtual fundraising for free. Our basic plan is completely free. There's no fees. There's no platform fee. There's no monthly fee. Um, the only fees that are involved in that would just be the standard processing fees, which um, are kind of unfortunately unavoidable. Um, and then you also will get an example materials package. So I'm going to be going over a lot of examples and I want to give you the opportunity to dive a little bit further into them. Um, so I'll point out a few highlights and then you'll get that materials package so that you can have that in front of you while you're going through everything. So Without further ado, let's get into the details of our class number one. So uh, we're gonna start off with just a brief introduction to virtual fundraising. Just really go over the basics and, and what that means for you. Um, and then we're gonna take a step back actually and talk about digital fundraising as a whole and how virtual fundraising fits into that. Next, we're gonna be assessing your virtual fundraising and going through where your needs are and where virtual fundraising can fit um, at your organization in the long term. And then we're gonna be talking very specifically about your first virtual fundraiser and how you can get started planning that. So we have a lot of deliverables for you. So you'll come away with some concrete next steps throughout our class to really help you um, make sure that you're set up for success with your virtual event. So we have our templates available. Um, so you're gonna get a completed event overview. So that'll set the stage for planning your virtual event. We're gonna get you the detailed goal and budget worksheet for you to fill in with your own goals and bu budgets and help you um, identify your goals and tackle potential obstacles along the way. Um, we're also going to be giving you a day of event details template. So making sure that if you are doing a actual live stream or live event, we'll have that uh, format for you all set so that you can sort of follow that along and make sure that your event goes off without a hitch. Then there's also the event plan and calendar template. This is basically your master list of all of the activities that you're doing from uh, pre-event to post event, so that'll be um, really your guide guiding um, 
list of all of your activities. We're also providing you a fundraiser toolkit checklist. We'll get into a lot about what that actually looks like later. And then we're also providing that one-on-one -on -one co coaching session. So I'll be sitting down with you and going over your plans so that you can optimize them. All right, so here are your templates. So I uh, just talked through what those look like. This is your budget and goal template. This is your, uh, this is actually um, your toolkit template. This is the overview, event overview template. This is that full event plan and calendar. And this is your day of event agenda. So your first uh, action item is to download your virtual fundraising event planning guide and calendar template. So just give me one second. I'm gonna post the link right here so that you have that in front of you. Um, so you can download that right now if you'd like, or I will be sending it out in the email as well. Um, so if you don't get a chance to download it right now, um, you can still have that. So I need to post that in the chat. Um, so you guys should all see that now. So feel free to grab that when you have the chance. All right, so let's uh, just do a brief introduction to virtual fundraising events. So let's start at the basics. What is virtual fundraising? So a virtual fundraising is an online fundraising event. Instead of gathering in person, you're basically bringing that um, digitally with technology. So usually involving live streaming can involve some video, social media, along with a digital fundraising software to help you really raise all of your funds online. Uh, virtual fundraisers aren't new, but they are rapidly growing, of course. So in today's context, there's a lot that is bringing us to virtual fundraising that I'm sure um, is some of the reasons why you're here. So um, at this point in time, nonprofits are having a tough moment. I mean, you rely on a lot of in-person just from donor relations to events to um, even just operations and programming. So um, it is a tough moment um, for everyone, but it's specifically impacting a lot of the nonprofits that I've worked with and um, I've heard a lot of their struggles at the moment. And a lot of that has to do with the economic contraction happening that are causing tighter budgets to get even tighter, unfortunately. So there's been a big limit on the funds available. Um, it's also been a challenge because you've had to reimagine how you work. So whether it is your programs or just the way that you as a nonprofit um, worker are, are doing your work. So you've had to bring that all virtually. So I'm sure some of the things that we go over when we talk about virtual fundraising also overlap with maybe some of the ways that you've run your programs virtually. Um, this is the biggest one and kind of the point of our discussion today is that in-person fundraising events for the foreseeable future are canceled. Um, so there's a rapid transition to virtual fundraisers and there's has been a little bit of a bump in the road where there's a lot of confusion around what it is that you actually need to to do to organize the virtual fundraiser. So um, hopefully today's class will help you create a very clear path on how you can run your in-person events instead virtually. Um, and unfortunately, the reality is, is that we don't know how long this is gonna go on. Um, a lot of organizations that I chat with will ask me, should I plan my event for the fall? And my answer is probably plan it virtually first. And then if you're able to do it in person, that's great. Um, I would say at least through the end of 2020, plan on doing virtual events in, instead of in-person. Um, and probably early 2021 as well. Of course, things are changing all the time, but the reality is, is that we don't exactly know how long this is gonna go on. So I would play it safe and go virtual first when it comes to fundraising events. So uh, we've also been seeing here at Causebox with the rapid adoption of virtual fundraising, um, marketing and fundraising is very quickly <laughs> becoming one and the same. So uh, digital marketing and digital fundraising overlap quite a bit. And so we're seeing that the best digital fundraisers or the be best virtual fundraisers 
are also the best digital marketers and vice versa. So this is going to be something that we touch on throughout our conversation, um, especially next week, just going over um, even more detailed uh, marketing, digital marketing best practices for your virtual fundraising events. So we'll help you kind of bridge that gap um, in that way and kind of cover those bases. All right, so when it comes to virtual fundraising, there's actually a ton of advantages. I know a lot of organizations um, are feeling like they're missing out on um, just that presence of being in person, but I think there's a lot of ways that you can facilitate that by creating that atmosphere to your virtual fundraiser. Um, and then there's also a lot of very practical advantages when it comes to virtual fundraising. So a lot of that is lower event costs, especially right now where tight budgets are super tight. Uh, <laughs> our already tight budgets are super tight. Um, these lower event costs for virtual fundraising make a huge difference for what you actually bring in through your event. So that's going to be a huge thing that you'll want to keep in mind um, because that really means that you get a much higher return on investment from virtual fundraising events than in-person fundraising events. Um, you're not paying for the, the space. You're not always paying for food. You're, you're um, kind of avoiding a lot of the bigger costs when it comes to running a fundraising event. Um, there's also a higher return on effort. So you and your team um, will have a lot that you need to plan for an in-person event. Um, you still have a lot that you need to plan for a virtual event, but it eliminates a whole section of the tasks that you have to do where you're no longer trying to con communicate with um, the, uh, like the event space and you're no longer um, having to deal with a lot of those in-person challenges that come in. So it's a little bit easier for you to actually run a virtual fundraiser than it is a uh, in-person event. The, one of the biggest advantages that I've seen and have heard from a lot of the organizations that we work with is that there's actually a much wider range of participants and supporters that can be part of your virtual event, where, of course, where an in-person event is located in a specific location, a virtual event can be attended from anywhere. So we're actually seeing that when it comes to peer-to-peer -to -peer types of virtual events, there's more participants because you're able to draw from a wider range of people and more attendees at the end of the day and therefore more supporters. So uh, it's really interesting to see how that has played out in recent months and how um, bringing things online actually widens um, who can be part of your event. So it's huge value. Um, and also less administrative tasks. So, uh, you know, kind, kind of along with that higher return on effort, there's just less for you to have to manage on the back end when it comes to just doing things virtually. And we'll go over um, some tips later about how you can even make those administrative tasks um, more streamlined so that you have less work on your end. So at the end of the day, advantages of virtual fundraising is that you take home more funds uh, for your programs with a lot less effort. So uh, lots of things that I'm really excited about when it comes to virtual fundraising. So we've seen this here on, on Causevox. So we've seen that typically um, a, an in-person event costs about $50, $50 to raise $100 to throw. Where on Causevox, when people run their digital fundraising, or virtual fundraisers on Causebox, it typically costs about $3 to raise $100. So you're really maximizing your um, return on investment at that point. So we've seen this in action with um, a few organizations that have been reporting their numbers back to us. The first one that I wanted to share is our this case study with Summit Assistance Dogs. So they were able to actually get more um, so let me back up. So what they did is that they had a virtual luncheon. It was scheduled for May as an in-person luncheon and they quickly transitioned to virtual. So one of the big things at <laughs> their organization was trying to navigate this switch. And I think that they did it really, really flawlessly. So I'll um, kind of bring them up throughout our conversation. One of the things that they reported back to us is that typically they had virtual table captains who, uh, or typically they had in-person table captains who were kind of tasked with filling a table at their luncheon, 
Typically these tables raise $10,000 if they were full. Um, so they just really brought that same idea virtually. So they challenged their individuals to instead become virtual table captains where they had their own personal fundraising page and attracted people to donate to their personal fundraising page and raise $10,000. So um, they saw that work really well. And one of the best things about it is that they were actually able to engage more virtual table captains than in-person captains because they were able to draw from a wider range of people. Um, they also reported back that they spent $50,000 less in event costs. So hugely limiting their event costs. So they had more funds um, that they took home at the end of the day. They took home uh, $35,000 more from their virtual fundraising event than their in-person fundraising event last year. And so because of all this, their return on investment increased from 212% to over 1600%. So they saw about an eight times increase in return on investment. Um, so, <laughs> so that was a huge um, increase for them and they were really happy. They actually uh, came back and said that they will probably continue doing a hybrid even when they can do in-person events they'll probably do um, a virtual event alongside their in-person event as well so that they can really capitalize on getting the full experience both virtually and in person. <laughs> I think my cat joined the call for a second, so thanks for, uh... <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay, so how do we get started with virtual fundraising? So we're gonna be walking through this step-by-step um, with we're reviewing the uh, gaps in the budget and schedule. Um, we're also going to talk about pinpointing virtual fundraising opportunities, planning your specific virtual fundraiser, and then we'll talk more about executing your first virtual fundraiser next time. All right, so let's take a step back and look at the digital fundraising methodology that we've seen work really well here at Cosvox as a whole and how that ties into virtual fundraising. So within the last two years, there's been a 24% growth in online donations. So there's already been this huge sort of, sort of shift to uh, digital and thereby virtual fundraising as well over the last couple of years. Um, and also in, in 2018, mobile giving increased by 205%. So not only are people moving increasingly more online, they're also moving increasingly on mobile and looking at getting mobile gifts um, more so than even from a desktop or other means. So a uh, huge growth in online as a whole and huge growth in mobile. So all of this really tells us that um, Digital fundraising isn't just the future of fundraising, it's now. So all of the um, statistics, and there's a bunch of other ones, but I just figured I'd focus on those two. But really everything that we're moving um, towards is um, this digital first type of fundraising. So uh, a lot of what our current state of fundraising looks like today is a lot of start, stop, project cycle of fundraising. So I talked to a lot of organizations that really say like they only do fundraising once or twice a year. So they do a big fundraising push at the end of the year and maybe they do a spring campaign. And so I'm sure some of you fit in that box where you're like, well, I'm trying to, our spring event was canceled, but now I'm trying to uh, bring that virtually. And that's perfectly fine to keep those um, events in place and those um, those cycles in place, but I would also argue that you really do need a repeatable process so that you're um, you move from only doing fundraising a couple times a year to constantly doing fundraising throughout the whole year and having those um, events as sort of highlights in the process. So that being said, uh, we found we um, really constructed this digital fundraising cycle. Um, which will help you create a repeatable process to grow your fundraising consistently online. So you want to build your audience by really increasing web traffic. So investing in search engine optimization on your website so that more people will find you when they're searching um, for causes like yours. Also investing in social media, getting um, online and being visible and present so that you can draw um, a greater audience and also exploring digital ads. 
uh, once you have more people through the door, more people coming to your website, more people coming to you online in various ways, you want to continue to nurture them. So hopefully they sign up for your email list and you can uh, do some email nurturing and continue to build on a relationship with these individuals that are interested in your cause. Um, and then ultimately, of course, everyone that <laughs> uh, is attracted to your organization, you're going to want to try to convert them into donors. And the great thing about this is that um, once you have a donor, you can continue nurturing and converting them. So that's all about really keeping in touch with those donors, continually um, getting them to convert with um, uh, of various types of fundraising and, and inviting them to participate, um, but also with peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So maybe you have a donor that's given a few times and a great next step for them could be to become a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser so that they can fundraise on your behalf, bring in their friends and family. So now they're attracting more people to your cause and you're sustainably growing your digital fundraising. So all of this really does look like a very repeatable process that you can constantly keep in place. And so um, at the end of the day, every donor that comes through your door or every person that attends your virtual event, um, there's, there's a commitment happening there on their end. So they're committing to being interested in your organization. They're committing to um, your cause and you want to invite them on a whole journey with your organization and continue to engage them, um, you know, existing donors looking for them to increase their gift size, or um, maybe a donor gives once a year and you want them to um, instead become a recurring donor. So having these kinds of goals in place to continue taking your donors on a journey and really sharing stories is a huge part of developing and deepening that relationship with them as well. Um, so with everything going on at the moment, it really has never been more important to stand up digital fundraising to have a sustainable source of income coming online all the time. So, um, and then virtual fundraising is really just built on these digital fundraising best practices where if you're doing digital fundraising all the time and you have those um, systems in place where you're continually attracting, nurturing, and converting donors, virtual fundraising gets a lot easier. So um, really virtual is sort of built on those basic principles. So I wanted to go through just a few best practices really um, when it comes to digital fundraising and look into how you can incorporate this throughout um, your digital fundraising plan for the year, um, especially throughout the rest of 2020 and early 2021. So um, as far as uh, media goes and attracting new donors, there's Facebook ads, uh, which are a great way for you to increase uh, your audiences. You can do lookalike audiences, which are basically people who like causes similar to your organization. You can target them and bring them in. Um, Google ads, there's the Google ad grant. Um, I highly recommend you looking into that. We have a whole session on that from our digital fundraising summit. So if you're interested, let me know. I can point you in the right direction for our whole series on um, or our whole um, webinar on the Google ads. Um, there's also earned media. So that's really increasing your content generation so that you're increasing traffic to your website and targeting people to, um, uh, or rather increasing your visibility online. So when you do come up in Google search when people search for um, things related to your cause. And then the next couple of things, because um, we're going to talk a little bit about nurturing later um, when it comes to actually nurturing those who you want to participate in peer to peer. So we'll get into that um, later on. But um, digital fundraising, um, you want to have a huge focus on mobile, um, both optimization and mobile payments. So when you come, when it comes down to choosing a platform for you to use for your virtual fund fundraising event, it's really important that it's both mobile optimized, which means that if someone goes on their phone, they can really easily um, see the page, they can give very easily, they don't have to play around with the sizing on their phone, it's just automatically formatted. So it's really easy to navigate on mobile. And then for mobile payments, that is like Apple and Google Pay so that 
Um, anyone on their phone, they don't actually have to take out their credit card to make a payment. They can just in one click uh, make a payment with their payments that they already set up on their phone. So that also increases conversion rates by a lot and it just and makes it really easy to give. So uh, that's really where the trends are going is especially towards mobile payments. So we've at Cosbox have in incorporated that into all of our campaigns and donation pages. Um, recurring giving is on the rise as well. So I would encourage you to look into recurring giving and making sure that that um, is incorporated into your fundraising plan for the year. I won't get into all the details, but I think a great next step for after a virtual fundraising event is to maybe target those who gave and see if they can become recurring donors in the next few months. And we're gonna get into peer-to-peer -peer fundraising when it comes to um, the context of virtual fundraising in just a little bit. So um, my suggestion to you is to consider the ways that you want to incorporate these sustainable digital fundraising best practices into your fundraising plan so that you can continually increase your virtual fundraising success. So that's my whole spiel on background on digital fundraising. So let's dive a little bit more into assessing your virtual fundraising needs and where these opportunities actually lie. Because a lot of the organizations I chat with, they might have one event already in mind that they just wanna bring virtual, but usually there's a lot more there that uh, there's a lot more opportunities there. So um, we'll start with the obvious. So existing fundraising plans that were canceled. So um, thinking through what has been initially disrupted for you. Um, so, uh, you know, did you have a 5k plan that can probably be brought virtually or um, like some of the assistance dogs, a luncheon or a gala also very practical to bring online. So uh, there's probably a lot of things that you already have in mind when it comes to a specific event that you want to bring online. Um, so I would, of course, put that at the top of my to-do list as far as um, when it comes to building out that first virtual fundraising event. Um, but I would also think about for any events that you can't translate online, um, consider what you won't be bringing in from that event and incorporate that into your plan. Maybe you can do a different type of uh, virtual event to replace that one, even if it's not the same type of event. Um, I've seen a lot of organizations do this where they have this whole thing planned and now they're like, actually, we're just going to do this week long challenge and, and completely sort of shift focus. So, uh, yeah, so maybe reimagining those existing fundraising plans when it comes to virtual events, if it doesn't work, um, if, if an in-person event doesn't exactly translate virtually. And I would also consider any sunk costs. So when you do have these fundraising events that have already fallen through, did you lose any money on that? Um, you know, did you not get a refund from an event space? Did you have um, already um, hired a consultant that <laughs> helps you plan it already? So I would consider any sunk costs and factor that into your fundraising goals when it comes to setting them for your virtual event. So uh, as far as virtual events go, there are <laughs> really the sky's the limit. Um, a few that I've just seen is just actually just bringing everything um, online and just a very simple crowdfunding campaign. Um, more often I see peer-to-peer uh, -peer fundraising because a lot of event attendees, they could also be um, recruited to instead fundraise on your behalf with their friends and family. I also am seeing a lot of DIY challenges. So um, instead of doing a, an event at a specific time, letting your peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers actually choose their own challenge and do it on their own timeline. Um, of course, I see uh, virtual galas um, or uh, incorporating live streams into them, virtual races or forgoing the actual race and instead doing a no run run where people commit to not running and raising funds. Um, there's a lot here. So I'm just going to leave this here for you for a minute um, so you can kind of explore those. And I'm sure you have your own ideas as well. Um, so um, I would encourage you to really explore and get creative with your virtual fundraising ideas. And we can even chat through more specific ideas for you um, in our one-on-one -on -one session. So I figured um, I would talk through just a couple of these examples. So 
Um, N10, they just did a really simple peer-to-peer -peer campaign with their board members. So um, they typically do um, the nonprofit technology conference, which unfortunately got canceled. It was too late to bring it online. So to replace their sunk costs, they just spun up a typical crowdfunding campaign, um, but also then uh, engaged their board members to become part of that. So far, it's been really successful. Um, so they're still uh, a little ways out for really their end date. I think they just want to raise this by the end of the year so that they can offset any sunk costs for the event that was canceled. So um, you can take a look at these slides later when it comes to getting into the details of their specific fundraiser. Um, some of the assistance dogs, this is the one I um, showcased earlier that had that really amazing return on investment when it came to bringing their lunch in virtually. So they set a goal originally of $175,000. They raised more than $10,000 from their goal. Um, what they did is that they incorporated their YouTube live right onto their page. So this screenshot here, that's actually their live event um, that has since passed. And now you can go back and view. Um, also things that I liked about how they set it up. So they put in a lot of content on their page. So you'll see they're linking to their virtual table captain guide. So that's their toolkit effectively to help their virtual table captains really succeed when it came to online fundraising. They also had a match in place. So they're showcasing that. Um, they got their $25,000 match, which was really exciting to see. So um, incorporating that kind of language on the page is great. Um, also linking out to if you are doing live streams, so they were showcasing and linking out to their YouTube channel um, for further engagement day of um, where people can even chat in during the live conversation. Um, they also had event sponsors, so they, they featured them on their page as well. So they had gold level, uh, silver, bronze, and linked back to all of their sponsors right from their page. So this is what the virtual table captains looked like. So typically each person would have brought their friends to their in-person event, but instead they brought them to their online event. So they basically just uh, created their own personal fundraising pages and shared social via social media, email, um, and other ways to bring them to their virtual table. And so here's just an example of one of those virtual tables. Um, so three people got together and they wanted to raise funds and um, they ended up doing quite well. Um, I think they actually raised over $10,000 at the, the end of the day um, for the organization. So one of the things I really liked about their um, campaign is that they made it really personal. They challenged everyone to um, update their profile picture with a picture of their dog. Um, and that was a really nice way to sort of feature even the cause front and center on their personal fundraising page. And then I also think that these personal fundraising pages, they made them really personal. So they told really stories about how the organization has impacted their life personally. And so I think that's actually something that you can do on a personal fundraising page when you're bringing something online that you can't really do in person. So, you know, usually at an event, not everyone that brings friends to the table personally uh, testifies at the event um, to what the organization has done for them. But this uh, makes it really, really nice and heartfelt and personal. Okay, so then other types of events is that uh, I saw this virtual walk. So the Keys to Success virtual walk was run by the Arizona Friends of Foster Children Foundation. Um, they ended up doubling their goal when they brought their event online this year and ended up getting uh, 10, funding 10 youth um, youth's <laughs> years of services um, in their program. So that's been really exciting to see. And you can see how they built it out. I mean, they had a registration fee for everyone that was signing up. Um, so they charged everyone $35 and they mailed everyone a t-shirt. One of my favorite things about their campaign is that they had a hashtag specifically dedicated to it so that they were um, really challenging everyone to share on social media with the hashtag so that you can really keep in touch throughout the um, virtual fundraiser. So I think having those kinds of engaging qualities to your campaign is really important where people can um, really keep in touch online and see activity beyond just what's on the campaign site or your landing page. Um, they also featured a lot of their participants and they 
I had quotes and everything throughout their page, which I thought was a really nice touch. Um, they had about 40 people that participated in the walkathon virtually. Um, so everyone kind of chose their own challenge. So Chris here, he said if he met his $2,500 goal, he would walk to work in Phoenix in June. So, <laughs> so, so his friends all gathered together to make sure that he walked to work in the heat <laughs> and helped him raise over four thousand dollars for the organization on his virtual walk page so this is basically some of the ways that we've seen um virtual fundraisers here at Cosvox. there's tons more so if you're interested in seeing more just let me know and i can get you more specific uh, examples that are maybe closer to what you're looking to do um, and so basically all I'm saying is at the end of the day, your virtual fundraising can be really specific, it can be really creative. And so I think um, when it comes to virtual fundraising and translating existing events online or even exploring new events, um, it's really only limited by your creativity and adaptability. So there's a lot of ways to make virtual fundraising super engaging and really effective and having that same sort of feel when it comes to having an event online. All right, so that's uh, talking about those already existing uh, events. Now let's talk about where some of your other needs might be that a virtual fundraising event might fit into. So there is programmatic fundraising needs. So it's likely that your organization has had to shift how you run your programs. So um, a lot of these programs have a lot of costs that come along with shifting them. Um, so first one that comes to mind is New Yorkers Against Gun Violence. They uh, recently ran a campaign on our platform because they had to completely shift how they did programs to make everything go virtual. And a lot of that, um, it was very uh, costly. So um, think about ways that you've had to change your programs. And I think that's a good opportunity to express a need and have a virtual fundraiser for that need. Um, and uh, Homeless Children's Playtime Project was a great example of this as well, where they had to really quickly shift how they run their programs and compiled uh, play kits. So they did a Giving Tuesday Now campaign, but they, they led up to um, that online um, by basically doing some peer-to-peer -peer fundraising ahead of time and engaging people in their virtual fundraiser to uh, raise funds through Giving Tuesday Now, which I believe was on May 5th. Um, but you can do your own giving day too and a kind of um, fundraise around that. Um, Hebrew Free Loan Society has also been doing their crowdfunding campaign basically. Um, so this really did come from the huge need that's happening right now where a lot of small businesses are desperately in need of loans. Um, so they got this campaign together to really offset those um, needs and provide for um, provide more loans. So they quickly spun up this campaign to really fill in those gaps. All right, and then there's operational fundraising needs. So uh, think about what operational expenses are currently in jeopardy or will be in jeopardy um, at this time. You know, so cost of rent, staff, unforeseen purchases needed to run your organization, really anything else that you can think of. Um, so where, where there's a need, there's an opportunity for you to do fundraising around it. So I would just really consider thinking through wh what gaps you currently have in your whole um, budget and fundraising plan for the year and see how you can fill that with a virtual fundraiser. So for example, Camp Westwind, this, they ran this whole campaign or are still running this campaign um, to really just cover operational expenses for the year because everything got turned upside down with, with um, the coronavirus for their organization. So um, yeah, I would consider building out a virtual fundraiser to even, um, take care of operational costs if you, if you need that. Um, so there's a lot of new fundraising opportunities um, that you can really explore to bring in more virtual fundraising into your um, fundraising plan. So I would just think through your plans for the rest of 2020 and early 2021 and just uh, incorporate uh, digital and virtual fundraising into your plans. 
So um, I will be getting to, I see there's a few questions. Um, I would just want to pause and answer them for a second. So um, I would do the spreadsheet when you're downloading it as an Excel um, spreadsheet, because then you can just plug in all of your details. Um, and so uh, around mobile giving, so that's really just anyone giving on their phone. Um, it can be done with just, you know, credit card or there's also mobile payments. Um, through Apple and Google Pay. So that makes it really easy for people to give in one click. Um, I'll also be able to um, answer any of your other questions in our Q&A. I just wanted to get those two out of the way for the moment. Um, okay, so let's talk about creating your first virtual fundraiser. So first step is determining your goals and budget for your fundraiser. So um, when you're planning your virtual fundraiser, you of course want it to be as smart as possible. So specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time bound. So really just coming up with very um, specific goals will, will make it a lot easier for you to communicate to um, your community what you actually need to happen out of this fundraiser, how much you need to raise, how many people you want to engage, how many donors you're hoping to acquire. So when you're thinking through your smart fundraising goals, um, make sure they're also you know, realistic. Uh, you wanna see if you don't have a, if you haven't run a specific virtual fundraising event in the past, I would A, uh, kind of look at your fundraising event from last year, if this is an annual thing that you do and see what you raised last year and uh, see if you can, um, sort of base your goals off of what you brought in last year. Um, also, if you haven't done this, if this is like a new event for you, I would take a look at what other uh, online initiatives you've done in the past and kind of use that as a baseline when it comes to setting your goals. Um, also having a specific time frame around it is pretty important um, just because that communicates to your donors when this is happening and um, what that uh, really looks like for your organization. So um, when you're thinking about determining your goals, these are a few things that I would suggest thinking through. Um, so one is how much do you need to raise? So uh, going through sort of those best practices that I um, talked through, like what are the gaps in your budget that you need to fill? Um, also thinking through uh, how many people you want to be benefited uh, from, from this virtual fundraiser that will help you in your communications. Um, also, how many funds, uh, how the funds are being used and distributed. So uh, is it an operational campaign or is it more programmatic or um, kind of having that uh, very clear, clearly laid out when you, you know, set up your goals for your virtual fundraiser. How many people do you want to attend if you're doing a live stream or if you're doing um, you know, something that's uh, at a specific day and time. How many people do you want virtually attending? How many sponsors do you want to get? And also think about if you are doing peer to peer fundraising, which I would really highly recommend, how many peer to peer fundraisers you're looking to engage. Um, and so do your best to kind of map these out ahead of time because it'll really help you throughout your communications. So we actually have in our budget and goals template. You can use this as a baseline. Um, also just kind of mapping in your own goals. You might have more goals or different goals than this. So uh, your goals should be all your own. Um, I would map them out in that template whenever you get the chance. And then the next step would be to actually create your budget. So think through all of the costs. There's gonna be programmatic costs still, even though it's gonna be a lot lower than doing an in-person event, um, but you might need to invest more in video production than you have before. So that's something to think through. Um, also thinking through any speakers or performers and how that's gonna work. Um, you know, Maybe they need some equipment. So uh, consider all the costs when it comes to actually running the, the program. Um, and then also considering all of the costs around technology and live streaming, fundraising software, transaction fees, which are a big thing that we'll um, talk a little bit about as well. Um, any prizes or giveaways that you're doing, even though things are being done virtually, there's tons of opportunities for you to have these really engaging prizes and giveaways and um, different ways to, um, you might need to consider as far as costs go. 
also promotion. So with something being more digitally focused, that's also going to be more of an investment on the digital marketing side. So think about investing in targeted advertising for your virtual event um, to attract a wider audience. I think that would be um, very wise, especially for a virtual fundraising event. And then also um, consider the, the cost and of staff time uh, when it comes to planning your virtual event. So I would suggest when you do think through all of these things, kind of mapping them out and having an estimated amount um, that you expect to spend on each. This will help you get a great idea of how much you're actually spending on your event and then in turn your return on investment, which we'll get into calculating very specifically later as well or um, during our next conversation. Um, and then using this budget as a very uh, specific way for you to actually track everything as um, your expenses are made. So um, this can help you map out not only this fundraiser so you know exactly what you're spending and exactly what you're taking home, but also helping you see what the real costs are so that um, when you are comparing doing in-person to virtual events next year, maybe it actually makes a lot more sense for you to continue doing your event virtually um, because there's just so much less cost. So I would really encourage you to use this budget template to map everything out. Um, so you have all of that in front of you when it comes to your expenses, both beforehand and afterward. All right, so uh, the next step is to estimate your income. So um, thinking through all the different ways that you're expecting to receive funds. So um, it's likely that you're gonna have sponsors, even though your event is now being moved virtually, a lot of the virtual events that I'm seeing online have sponsors and there's actually a great way to feature them. So maybe even better than in person, to be honest, because on a campaign like you were seeing it on uh, the Summit Assistance Dogs example earlier, they actually linked back to all of their sponsors websites. You can always feature their logos right on your uh, landing page as well. And also um, encourage if I would encourage you throughout your live stream, if you are doing one, um, showcasing them throughout the conversation on live stream. And so I think that's a, a really great way to um, kind of pitch it to those sponsors and, and keep any existing sponsors on board and also acquire new ones, of course, for your virtual fundraiser. So think through how much you're hoping to bring in through sponsors, also peer to peer fundraisers. Um, you probably want to have an idea of what, of both how many peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers you're expecting to participate um, and, and sort of narrowing that down, even if that's just the board, um, for example, um, or a youth advisory board, if you have one, those are great to draw from. Um, but think through how many peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers you are expecting um, to participate and how much you're actually expecting them individually to bring in, because that will help you really estimate your income really well. Um, also, gen general attendee donations throughout your, your live stream, again, if you're doing one, I would try to continually make those asks throughout the conversation so that um, you're driving more donations both ahead of your event and during your event as well. Um, sales. So uh, we're going to get into what this looks like um, more specifically, but are you doing ticketing? Are you doing registration for your 5K? Are you selling t-shirts? Um, think through all the sales that are gonna be involved in your event and um, the number of attendees to estimate your income. And also consider any matching grants or gifts that you're able to get. One of the best things that I really encourage a lot of our, our users to do is try and get a matching um, grant or a large matching gift, if at all possible. So I know um, sometimes it's hard last minute to get a grant in place, but I would also um, look at a major donor, maybe an existing major donor who is already pledged to your organization and see if you can repurpose their gift as a matching gift for your virtual fundraiser or, um, you know, ask your board and see if your whole board would pull together to do a, a up to $5,000 mat match, for example, for your campaign, because matching really can spur donations and that um, really helps a lot of the activity to be very exciting, um, keep up the energy levels throughout your campaign. So I would think through at least those five things uh, when it comes to estimating your income, but there's more of course. So um, 
I would also use this template to fill out all of your estimated income so you have um, a pretty good idea of what you're hoping to bring in. Um, and then you can also use this, of course, to actually keep track during and after your event as well. So action item for you is to, to determine and fill out your goal sheet, create your budget, and estimate your income. All right. So uh, now that we've decided on really the goals for your event, let's decide on the format and pick a fundraising software package. Um, so your, uh, your event, so you wanna think through how your event will actually be held. Um, so you wanna consider how your end date is gonna work um, for your event and your launch and end date. I would say between the time that you put your campaign online to, for your virtual event, have it be at least six weeks out, um, just to give enough time for both peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers to participate if you're doing that, um, and also just enough time for you to get the word out, um, especially with digital ads. So I would give yourself a little bit of, um, a little longer than a month. Uh, a month is fine too, um, but I would, I would put it at a, about six weeks out at least. Um, when you're doing a virtual fundraiser. Um, also consider doing more of like a rolling campaign. So that um, virtual walkathon that I showed you earlier, they didn't actually have any specific um, date when it came to, um, they had an end date for their campaign, but they didn't have a specific date that they wanted people to do their walk on because it was more of like a rolling initiative that they let their participants really make and choose on their own. So I would consider if that's uh, the way that you want to run your fundraiser um, as well and, and making sure that you give people enough time for them to actually make their own timelines um, when you're considering it. So uh, also there's the, uh, when it comes to fundraising, there's basically just two ways that you can do virtual fundraising. Um, the one is more of crowdfunding style where you're just putting up a campaign site and driving funds to that one campaign site. Or if you're doing more like how Summit Assistance Dogs did and did peer-to-peer -peer fundraising where they engaged their virtual table captains um, to raise funds on their behalf. Same sort of thing with the walkathon where um, Arizona Friends of Foster Children Foundation engaged a lot of their youth advisory board to set up their own peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser. So that's peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is very specifically very effective right now because it's dry, drawing from donor um, your relationships with your existing relationships both with members in your community and their relationships with their friends and family. So that's kind of one of the best ways that you can actually grow your fundraising right now. Um, it's kind of a hard time in general to acquire new donors, but the exception is peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So I would encourage you for your virtual event, look for a way to incorporate peer-to-peer -peer into it because it's going to be really helpful. Um, the other thing is to think about uh, DIY activities, your day of live stream, um, how you're really doing your event participation. So maybe people are just doing it on their own and you want them to share on social media. It's more of a um, DIY initiative or you're you know, having actually some kind of live event. Um, and I've seen both too. So you can have people sort of run things on their own and then have something culminating at the end as well. So think about how uh, the different components of your event and how you're looking to do it. And also how you're looking to bring in the majority of your revenue. So, um, of course, this could be, uh, there could be a few different ways that you do this, where it's donation-based and fee-based, um, or both. Um, I've seen a lot of virtual fundraisers really kind of forego the fees instead, like, so instead of charging tickets, um, just make it like a $10 suggested donation to attend, for example. So I've seen a little bit of a, um, move from from fee-based fundraising um, to more just suggested donations and and driving revenue specifically by asking for donations but either way just think through how you're looking to um, get revenue through your virtual fundraiser and so once you've made some decisions when it comes to how you're actually running the uh, event 
you actually want to then pick out some virtual fundraiser software to help you run this really effectively. So um, the first is deciding on a virtual fundraising platform. And then also if you're doing um, live streaming, doing uh, finding an event streaming platform for that. And also thinking through other kinds of uh, software that can actually make your event go more seamless or is easier for you. So uh, my tip is to make your virtual event uh, as easy for yourself as possible. Um, if you, it can be as complex or as simple as you want it to be. And I just think um, when you make it easy for yourself to plan and also easy to participate in your virtual fundraiser, it's going to be um, so much more primed for success. So um, if something gets, if you're planning something and it gets to be too much, I would consider what would it look like without having that auction, for example. Um, maybe that's a thing that you skip this year, even though you typically always do it. But I would just try and make it very easy for you to do virtual fundraising as a whole. So that being said, let's talk a little bit about actually choosing that virtual fundraising platform. Um, so something that we've seen here at Cosvox is that 65% of all fundraising web traffic is on mobile and is growing each year. Um, and also 54% of consumers have used the mobile wallet to make a payment. So both of these things really do show that there's a huge shift towards mobile. Um, and that's kind of where you want whatever platform you choose, uh, you want to make it as easy as possible for both your peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers and your donors to uh, participate, especially your donors. You want to make sure that your forms are conversion optimized so that you're getting more donors. Um, you know, it's one thing where you put in so much effort to plan an amazing virtual event, but if it's hard to donate and people are going on your website and they're trying to click around and there's like a million fields for them to fill out, unfortunately, you're going to miss out. Um, so I would just look into ways that you can streamline the donation process as much as possible with whatever fundraising tool so that you can really optimize your results for your, for, uh, for your virtual fundraiser. So uh, Nancy Ramos put it like this. She said, the biggest thing is ease, ease for your fundraisers and ease for their donors. If it's hard for their donors to make a donation, they're just going to forget it, leave the page and move on. Cosvox makes it so simple for donors and for fundraisers. I've never had a fundraiser need help setting up a page. It's that straightforward. So uh, Nancy Ramos um, runs a um, over the edge event for the Girl Scouts of Northern Illinois each year. And all of the Girl Scouts and other participants as well set up their own personal fundraising pages ahead of their event to fundraise with their friends and family. So um, she's done this year after year and it's uh, really the biggest thing for her is making sure it's very easy. Um, so whatever you choose, uh, I really would highly recommend making sure it's easy both on desktop and on mobile specifically. Um, also having easy sharing options built in is, is a big um, tool to help them get the word out about their campaign. So uh, a few pro tips for choosing a virtual fundraising platform. Make sure that it's easy for you to set up. Um, you don't want to spend a lot of time working with a clunky product where you're wasting hours just trying to get this thing off the ground. I would look for something that's very easy to use. Again, just make everything as easy for yourself as possible because um, it can get really complicated really fast. Um, so easy to set up for you. Um, I would look into something that has peer-to-peer -peer capabilities. Even if you're not sure you want to include it in your virtual fundraiser at first, I would at least make sure that um, the capability is there so that in case you want to add it on later, you can. Um, also, make sure that it's easy to feature your content and your sponsors. Um, that's going to be a huge part of doing a virtual fundraiser is being able to have engaging content and making your sponsors happy on the page itself. Um, that you're building out online. Um, also easy to brand, making sure that like um, it, it's not filled with other, other brands already on the page. I know some platforms just kind of put their logos everywhere um, and it doesn't really look unique to your organization, but your virtual fundraiser should be very unique. It should be very branded. Um, and so that it's very clearly associated with your organization when they first get to the page. Like on Cosvox, you can even 
um, customize the URL. So Cosvox isn't in the URL, it's just under your organization's URL. Um, and also being able to pre-fill in info for fundraisers. So this is actually something that I hear back a lot that's been really helpful. So Emma from Summit Assistance Dog, she pre-filled in all of the information basically for her peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers to make it as easy as possible for her peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers to set up their pages. And she said that that actually um, helped more people get set up and running um, easier. So just make it as easy as possible for your fundraisers as well. Um, again, making sure it's mobile optimized and just as easy as possible to make a donation so that you're getting more donations through conversion optimized forms. Um, because if your donation form is conversion optimized, it's, you just get more donors coming in with less effort. All right, so now let's talk about if you are doing live streaming, what that is gonna look like for you. We're actually gonna go into very specific best practices for live streaming next week, but this is just about choosing a live streaming platform. Um, so one of the things that Emma from Summit Assistance Dog shared with us is that um, she recommended pre-recording uh, her video. So they did a 25 minute program it was all pre-recorded and then they just set it live on YouTube. So then everyone was watching it live. Um, it was very engaging, but that made sure that everything went off without a hitch so that there wasn't any major um, techn technology issues during the live stream. Um, they just had everything recorded beforehand, compile the video and then set it live. So I think that's a really smart way to do it. Um, it's gonna make it a lot less stressful for you. And it's also gonna make sure that everything runs really seamlessly. So that is a huge um, thing to just think about where even if you're live streaming, it doesn't have to actually be live. Um, you can actually prepare a lot of that content ahead of time. Um, sometimes just doing a pre-recording doesn't work. Maybe you wanna do part of it pre-recorded and then have the end be um, live streams. Um, also think about how you want to break up your event. So maybe your gala is like four hours long and there's so many different parts to it. Maybe you want to break it up into different sessions so that people can kind of pick and choose which events that they want to go to. Um, so in that way, people can be engaged for a full longer event if they want to by participate in each virtual event, but um, e each virtual live stream, um, or they can just kind of choose the thing that they're most interested in and attend that. So you might want to think about how you want to break it up. Um, live streaming should also be really engaging. There's a lot of live chat options um, with really any of the live streaming options. I would really do your best, um, kind of even right now, I'm seeing all the chats come in and I'll definitely get to your questions in, um, in a few minutes. But um, yeah, just make your, your event as engaging as possible um, with the live chat. And you also want to make sure that you can integrate it onto multiple pages and platforms. So make sure that you can embed it on your website. Make sure that you can embed it on your um, fundraising uh, platform and just have a lot of opportunities for that. <clears throat> a few of the ones that I see most is YouTube Live, Zoom, and sometimes I see Facebook Live as well. Uh, YouTube Live is probably the easiest to do the pre-recorded video um, and embed it anywhere. So I think that one's really easy if you want to go that route. Um, also Zoom. So if you want to do something a little more dynamic, a little more um, uh, uh, very personalized and, and live, um, I would do Zoom. Uh, they have breakout rooms, which you can actually pre-fill. So if you had a gala, for example, that you're trying to get online, and you really like the concept of people being in tables, you can do a program live and then have the, um, the tables sort of pre-selected beforehand and then hit a button and then everyone can uh, break out into their own breakout rooms and talk to each other in a smaller group setting. So that's one of the coolest things that I think is a very interesting way to kind of translate in person to um, online through Zoom. Uh, Facebook Live is also great. It has similar advantages to YouTube, <clears throat> um, but it's just not quite as inviting to non-Facebook users, especially when it comes to the chat functionality. Um, so I would probably choose YouTube Live or Zoom if it were me. 
um, but Facebook Live is also fine because you can um, embed it across um, platforms. I mean, I know it embeds on Causebox. Um, and so, of course, there are other options, but um, a lot of the other ones that I see are can be really um, expensive. So if you go to like professional, if you Google professional live streaming software, it's going to get really pricey really quick. Um, and uh, it, also, I don't know if it's as easy to integrate as these ones. So I would just um, keep it really simple. Um, and then as far as how many people are allowed in the breakout rooms on Zoom, um, I actually did some research earlier and it looks like it can be up to 50 people in a breakout room. So um, I would probably keep it smaller than that. I wouldn't go more than 10 if it were me, but also totally up to you how you want to run it. Um, okay, so other software to help you run your virtual event. So if you're doing a walkathon, race, or climb, um, Cosvox recently launched integration with Strava. So that is actually a tool that is, you can have on your phone, you can have it on your Apple Watch, you can have it on your Fitbit, and it'll track all your activities. And the great thing about uh, the integration is that then you can just post those activities on the personal fundraising page on Cosvox. Makes it a lot easier for you to track on, on uh, the admin side uh, all the activities that your fundraisers are doing. Also makes it really engaging for them. Um, so Strava is a great um, integration that we, uh, we've launched and, and just a really great tool to keep track of activity. So I think that's one of the easiest ways to um, really better run a virtual walkathon race climb or even swims. The Strava can almost track anything it seems like when it comes to activities. Um, also when you're thinking about other software I would uh, again make it as easy for yourself as possible. Look into Zapier to push donor data or attendee data into your uh, um, whatever you use to keep track of your donors and whatever you use to to do your email marketing. Um, so a few things that Zapier does integrate with. Um, so for example, if you were to run it on Cosvox, you can use Zapier to push all your donor data and fundraiser data automatically into Bloomerang, Little Green Light, Salesforce, Kindful, MailChimp, Constant Contact, QuickBooks, and more. So there's like 2,000 applications that integrate with Zapier. I would look into setting that up. Saves you a ton of time on the backend management side of things. Um, also, Cosvox does automatically send receipts and everything, so that's a separate thing, but also makes it easy um, on that end, so you're not having to manually send receipts. Uh, if you're doing an online auction, you might want to look for an online auction software. I actually don't think it's a great time for online auctions, just because a lot of small businesses are really affected at the moment. They're less likely to donate. Also, people sometimes that do an in-person auction, typically it's a different kind of setting. They've had a couple drinks and people, you know, uh, are kind of caught up in the moment. Um, and that's how you can really uh, optimize your auction. Um, online auctions, uh, I just think right now, and sometimes auctions actually um, are, have like a lot of vacation packages. So for, for a few reasons, I just don't think it's a great time for an online auction. So it also takes a long time to organize. So if I were you, I would skip it this year, but um, that's just kind of my opinion. Um, and then will you have a landing page? So um, it's one thing to do a live stream and it's one thing to do a fundraising um, platform and you can just use those two things. But on your website, you might wanna consider making a landing page. I found this really great example um, from Nicholas House. They're running their virtual event on Cosvox, but they have a um, landing page on their website specifically for their virtual event. So they're using API to actually pull the live updates of how much they're raising on Cosvox right onto their website. Um, it's very personalized, very customized and stylized um, for their specific event. Um, you'll see they actually have the donation form, um, the Cosvox donation form associated with their campaign embedded right on their landing page on their website. So really customized look and feel. Um, they also have start a peer to peer fundraiser. So when you click on that button, it goes right to Cosvox. People can create their own personal fundraising page to raise funds. You'll see what they did is that they had a few different types of panel discussions for their event. So they have a health panel, unemployment panel, children panel. Um, and there's even more, I think, there with the 
virtual event agenda. So um, I think that's really smart because they do have these different types of uh, discussions going on. So they have the opportunity for you to just register for one of them. Um, they also highlighted their sponsors on their landing page and included a lot of um, frequently asked questions at the bottom as well. Just made their page, I think, really clean looking, very, um, very in line with how you would actually typically see an event um, page look. So this is right on their website. They just built it out so that you might want to incorporate that into your to-do to list. So uh, when you make all these decisions as to how your event is going to be run, what you're going to be using for it, um, what you know some of those specific details look like, you'll want to go ahead and actually fill out your event overview sheet. Um, so again, this is a downloadable template. Um, if you're having issues downloading it, let me know. Um, and I can help, uh, help you get that. Um, but yeah, so I would just fill in all of the details for your, um, your event, how it's going to be run, what it's going to look like, and kind of all of the needs and purposes um, of your event as well. All right, I know we're like way over time here. I know uh, there's so much to get to and there's still so much next week. So thanks for um, sticking with me. Um, so let's talk a little bit very briefly about peer to peer for your virtual event. We've seen a lot of peer to peer campaigns on Cosvox. They typically raise twice as much as opposed to crowdfunding campaigns. So um, yeah, very effective way, especially when it comes to virtual fundraising to create that community sort of look and feel for your virtual event and get people really engaged actively in fundraising on your behalf. Um, when you're looking to do that peer-to-peer uh, -peer fundraising, like some of the assistance dogs did, like Arizona Friends of Foster Children Foundation did, um, there's a few types of people that you want to engage. So some of that is going to be board members or advisory board members or young adult board members. Um, those are all really great people to kind of be the first uh, go-to when you're asking people to, to fundraise for you because they're very close to your organization and more likely to participate. Um, also staff, if they're willing, uh, volunteers are great. They're already giving you your their time, so they're much more likely to also fundraise for you. Um, partners, so uh, this could be even an event sponsor. So giving an event sponsor the next step to actually create their own page as, you know, a as a partner, they can put their logo up on the page and send that out to their email list and give them the opportunity to showcase um, and fundraise for you actually right on your campaign. Um, returning donors, so anyone who's given more than once is, is a great person to um, also uh, put it out there and see if they'll become peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers for you. Uh, program alumni, so anyone that has a personal story about how your organization has impacted them, great people to, to ask to become peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers. Um, they're usually very passionate fundraisers and, and typically do very well. Um, so I'd keep that in mind. Um, and so Jake Vermillion, who's run several peer-to-peer -peer campaigns on Cosvox, he said from helping them to see the impact of the work that they're doing, to, uh, the work that they're helping to support, to making them feel supported and encouraged, to equipping them to becoming a, an effective fundraiser, Nothing has yielded better results than assigning liaisons, if you will, to each fundraiser who elects to support our cause. While technology can help reinforce a personalized approach, it can't replace it. So with all of this being said, how technology can help you run your peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, you definitely want to have that personal touch and recruit peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers one-on-one. -on -one. Have a point person that's communicating with that fundraiser. So um, also, you know, paying a little extra attention to those who are doing particularly well, and also paying a little extra attention to those who haven't really raised much yet and just checking in with them and seeing if there's anything that they're missing to help them really um, achieve their goals. Um, and just with peer-to-peer -peer in general, I would give fundraisers the opportunity to make it their own. Um, like, sort of like how some assistance dogs did, they had people post their own dog as their profile photo. And I think that's a really nice little touch um, to really make your fundraisers feel um, actively involved and have more ownership over their peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. But maybe you want to take it a step further and have them all do their own challenges, sort of like how Arizona Friends of Foster Children Foundation did. 
Um, one of the best things that you can do to equip fundraisers to succeed, I literally tell every single customer um, that is doing peer-to-peer -to, -peer to do this, create a uh, fundraising toolkit. So this is, uh, I took a few screenshots of the Summon Assistance Dogs one. I'll give you um, the link uh, in, in our um, materials package so that you can really comb through this and see all the details of their toolkit. But they provided a lot of guidance and a lot of um, email samples that their fundraisers could copy and paste and send out. Very effective and so that they don't have to create all the content on their own. Um, and they can still get the word out about your initiative. Um, also giving them like kind of a, an idea of the timeline. So they have a, like we suggest posting this the evening of May 6th or the morning of May 7th. So they're giving a lot of content for them to post on different platforms or email out. And they're also suggesting um, some timelines for them to do it. So if you're doing peer to peer, you definitely wanna do a peer to peer toolkit. Um, think about doing a sample communications calendar they can follow with pre-written social media posts and images, email templates, and um, a few of our customers have said that a training webinar on just here's how to set up your page and like here's some tips that we recommend has worked really well for them as well. I don't think it's necessary. I think just the toolkit is enough, but I think that's if you want to go above and beyond. Um, so also in our package, Here's the toolkit template. It's just some of the suggested things we recommend including. You don't have to do all of them. You could edit this, make it your own. Um, I would just do, uh, you can just do the basics, stick to pre-written social media posts and emails and just a sample communication calendar. And I think that really helps a lot. Um, so a little bit goes a really long way when it comes to creating a toolkit and um, having those materials ready for your peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers. All right, so <laughs> I know we're 15 minutes over. Um, that pretty much wraps up our discussion today. We went over a lot of details. Um, anything that you can, uh, I would take a look at the event planning calendar, start filling it out, um, due dates, things that you wanna have accomplished. There's a lot in there already. Um, you're probably gonna need to change it for your own event a little bit, but um, I would download that template. Um, make sure that you take a look, start editing it, maybe start putting some dates in. We're going to go over this in more detail next week. Um, so, or next class, I'm sorry, um, Friday. And uh, we'll, we'll get into the real details of the event planning calendar. Class two is on Friday, uh, the 26th, on executing your virtual fundraiser. So it's all going to be all about completing your virtual fundraiser plan, event, engagement, um, and live stream best practices. So um, even some tips on like how long it should be. So all of that's gonna be covered then. Um, then we're gonna talk a little bit about wrapping up your virtual event, uh, how to communicate to participants, um, some best practices when it comes to um, assessing how successful your event was, uh, including re calculating return on investment. And then we're gonna have an extended Q&A because I kind of knew that uh, we probably weren't going to get too much time today. Um, I'm going to stay on for the next few minutes to try and tackle as many questions. So anyone that wants to stay can. Um, anyone that needs to go, feel free. Um, but I, we're going to have a little bit more time next week for, for Q&A. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, you can run your virtual fundraiser on Causevox with no fees. We just launched this whole really cool thing where we don't take any platform fees on any, any of our plans. So if you're interested, let me know. Uh, also a reminder, we will have a one-on-one -on -one virtual fundraising consultation. So um, we'll get more time for you and I to just chat. And so let's go through questions. Um, uh, Mary asked, uh, can we embed our Cosvox crowdfunding page onto our website? So you can embed the whole page on your website. You can embed elements of it, um, sort of like what you were seeing um, earlier when it came to, um, uh, let me pull up this one. Yeah. So Nicholas house. Um, so they are pulling the, uh, fundraiser, uh, goal and progress bar right from Cosvox. That's live. Um, they also embedded their donation form from the, the, their campaign. And they also uh, included a link to become a personal fundraiser. Um, I don't 
think we have the API available for a scrolling donor list, unfortunately. Um, but I may be able to check on that for you. So um, if you want to just email me after, I can um, check with our team and see if we can make that available. Um, I got a question about um, Razor's Edge um, and how that works. Um, so unfortunately, there's not really a direct integration available through Zapier with Razor's Edge. Um, so I would just do uh, exporting and importing options. It's actually really easy. A lot of our customers do that. Um, and they said it's, it's really not too bad um, of a process. It's pretty quick and easy. Also happy to connect if you want more details on that. Um, let me post the template again, um, just because I have talked about this all day and want to make sure that everyone gets it. I also will be including this in the email out tomorrow. Um, so uh, just as a quick note, um, you are gonna just wanna go to file, download, and then download it as an Excel sheet. Um, so then you have all of these different tabs um, in the template for you to um, then on your own computer, customize and make your own. All right, and then I think that, um, really does it for today. I don't want to keep everyone too much longer. I tried to get through as many questions as I could. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm here as a resource. So any um, additional questions between now and our next class, please feel free to email me. Um, I'm going to post my email. It's just candace at causevox.com. You also probably have gotten some emails from me anyway. Um, also feel free to email support at causevox.com too. Uh, okay, uh, how did everyone feel about today's class? Uh, too much information, not enough information, love to hear from you. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll be going over tons more information during our next class, so I'm really excited about that. Yeah, Mary, you have a great question about, um, not doing auctions basically and how you continue to raise money. Um, so I, instead of putting your effort into a, an auction, which uh, of course that takes a lot of time to arrange as well, um, I would direct more of your attention to the peer-to-peer -peer side of things um, and really in, in creating those materials, recruiting more people and standing that up. Um, I think that just based on everything that we've seen here as well, we're like, um, peer-to-peer -peer tends to raise twice as much than any other type of digital fundraising. Um, you're going to probably see a lot of results by diving into peer-to-peer -peer further if that's something you haven't done before. Um, and I, I mean, I'm not saying you definitely shouldn't have an auction. It's just like this year it is a little bit harder because it, um, yeah, I mean, it's just harder to get those donations for the auction itself. And then it's harder to, um, if you have done it in person before, it's gonna be a little bit of a leap to get people to then participate um, virtually in the same ways. Um, so I just think like it's a little bit more of a challenge at this point. So I would lean further into the other types of digital fundraising, especially peer to peer um, when I came to that. And then peer-to-peer um, -peer is available on our basic plan. Um, you only get the personal fundraising pages, not the team pages. So team pages are like when groups of people can um, participate together um, and fundraise in, in groups. Um, so yeah, uh, that is pretty much that. So um, thank you everyone for sticking with me. I know we're 23 minutes over now, but um, had a lot to get to. So um, hopefully uh, this was all really helpful. I will be getting everyone the recording so then you can replay this later um, and go through all the specifics um, as well. So I look forward to our class on Friday and I'll be in touch in the meantime with the recording, the template and all the other details as well. Okay, I look forward to Friday. Thanks everyone, bye.